Welcome to a special edition of Biloxi Cooks. We're starting today's program with a Biloxi legend who's going to talk a little bit about old Biloxi and then he's going to cook up or have something cooked for us very special. David Bubba Matina, welcome. Thank you, sir. <laughs> we're welcome he, to Giuseppe's. I was going to say we're here at Giuseppe's, two blocks north of the Biloxi Lighthouse, and I got to tell you, man, a lot of people, old Biloxi people, will remember Geno's. Oh, sure. <clears throat> That was at Geno's. It was here. But I bought it from the previous owners. It was Geno's, and Geno's was an Italian restaurant, but it was a more or less a the, the checkered tablecloth in mm -hmm. the Chiani bottle with the candle on that type of thing. <laughs> and we still have some of their recipes. Mm -hmm. And uh, how are they being received by the public? Uh, fine. Those mm -hmm. are uh, those are kept secret. They are there. We're going to come back to the cooking in a minute, but first I want to talk a little bit about Bubba Matina and some of the things he has seen and done. And the earliest memory that I have of you is from the sports page, which was just a really hot night spot in West Biloxi back in the... In fact, let me put it this way. I think in the 70s and in the 80s, you had the Midas touch on the Biloxi nightlife. Walk us through your it, career. Well, it seemed that way. I mean, we opened a sports page. I had two partners at the time, uh, Joe Simonich and Hugh Webb. And I got the uh, Jake Mladenich, who on the Fiesta had this uh, place up above us. It was called uh, Kiko Simba, and they went broke. <laughs> so he invited me to come in and look at the place and see if I would be interested in leasing it. And I did. And I got my two partners and we came up with the idea of the sports page. And I think we were probably the, I'm, think, I'm positive we were the first uh, sports bar in, in the, uh, Mississippi. But you also told me earlier that you had to buy some sophisticated equipment, didn't you? We thought we had the first VCR. <laughs> That, that, that there was no commercial uh, seat that, that, that you could buy in any store or anything like that. And we, uh, it was it was huge. And the tapes themselves were big as Bible. <laughs> and it, it was, so Keesler Field had one and they use it for a, uh, for a, mm -hmm. students in the, uh, the teaching, a teaching aid. And we got it and uh, I, I would go down and record Wide World of Sports. Mm -hmm. and any kind of sports thing, because at that time there was no ESPN, there was mm -hmm. no continuous sports action, so we played these tapes. And the first tape I had well, came with the machine itself, the guy who recorded uh, uh, the first Muhammad Ali, Jill Frazier fight, which I think was 1973. Mm -hmm. So you made the move from the sports page yeah. where you were for about five or six years to Amelia's. Was that both nightclubs at the same time? Yeah, we didn't close one and open the other. Mm -hmm. They were both open at the same time. And as I say, the, the uh, Millions was fairly successful, but it didn't really get hopping until about two years later when I insisted that we stay open late at night. <laughs> In fact, I attended the bar when everybody else went home. And when you say late at night? Well, I would. Uh, they, they were closing it at 12, 1 o'clock when the and then I would come in there and I'd open it up to four or five, sometimes mm -hmm. six o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And sooner or later they started trickling in and be the, uh, you know, the bartenders, cocktail waitresses. What they, they call the service industry. The service industry, some dancers. Mm -hmm. and uh, Back in the day. Back in the day, the dancers. And uh, then the, pretty soon the golfers started following them and then, mm -hmm. then they saw the, the cars parked out front there and more people, more people came. And we, it wound up to be a late night spot, and I think it changed uh, the way a lot of people went out at night. Because we would stay open to 5, 6 o'clock in the morning on the weekends, and people, rather than going out at 7 or 8 o'clock, they were going out at 10 or 11. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and so we, and sometimes we'd walk out of there and it'd be the sun be up. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then you moved from Amelia's, where, as I recall, I don't take this the wrong way, but I think you were soft pedaling it there because Amelia's, as I recall, was just catching everyone's attention, so to speak. Oh, it was. It, it was. <laughs> it was doing well. We actually it was too good. The business was too good. That's too good for the room. We had people parking. And we're talking we had, about that at the White House Hotel. White House Hotel, where Coors is right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so popular, the people were parking all over the neighborhoods, and we were getting this 
people complained to the city, and then the city complained to me, and then I had just about had enough of it. So I started, I told them I would close down on Labor Day, which was the day that Elena hit. Mm -hmm. And I, at that time, I was, I was building the Oscars, take two. But which would be at the foot of Raynor Street, but... Uh, it was the old uh, bungalow restaurant, and now it's, it's part of... Uh, Beau Rivage. Mm -hmm. And so you moved over there to another place where you would have more room and you called it Oscars. I called it Oscars. I always had this in my mind that I was going to do a movie thing. Oh, well, let's back up a minute. Amelia's. Where did the name Amelia's come from? Well, I thought that there was thousands of girls in the Air Force right you right were a block street. away from Keesler. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so I thought if I called it Amelia's, which is the famous female aviator, mm -hmm. that that would attract these these girls, mm -hmm. and they had spendable income. They had you know the living on base and this. Yeah. Well, it didn't happen. It just <laughs> never. <laughs> so never it was not happened. until the late night hours. Yeah, until Amelia's, and it was. I mean, we had uh, I had pictures of Amelia's all over the place, and we had airplanes hanging from the, the airplanes hanging from the ceiling. And, and you uh, were capitalizing on the disco. Uh, uh, well, the disco, yeah, disco mm -hmm. had just started coming in. Mm -hmm. In fact, I went to a disco convention in New York City. Uh, in about 1976, and all I had is was this little sports page with a little dance floor. And, one little light that would go around. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, you're right. So the expense, you didn't have to have a band. Mm -hmm. You know, you had a DJ, and everybody mm -hmm. accepted that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I went to Amelia's, we, we had much more room, so we had two dance floors and more lighting and more sound systems and everything. And it just grew from there. And it, I don't think anybody around actually had that much live entertainment. Now, you were at Amelia's, you outgrew that location, and you moved to that front beach over there, and you do Oscars. I didn't outgrow it. I got... You what? I, I, well, the, the customer base outgrew it. <laughs> okay. In my parking. So you moved to park. the front beach, and you do Oscars in the front. When did you bring about David M's Spinnaker Run? Well, I had a friend of mine that had a, had a boat, a yacht, in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we'd go down there on different weekends, and I saw this place called Shooters that was on the on the uh, intercoastal canal. And they had a bulkhead, and boats would pull up there, and they would get service. For, and it was just busy all the time. I mean, all the time. So I'm I'm looking at behind me at this at, a, at Amelia's. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, at Oscars. At, 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 Oscars, too. at Oscars was uh, the same. It was the Deer Island was right behind there, and, and the bulkhead was there. I'm going like, what? Have, but otherwise, you had no amenities until you brought. Oh yeah, there was there was there was some apartments back there, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. So, what did you think of the success of Spinnaker Run? Well, it we got it, we got off to a bad start. The it was the wettest spring. <laughs> I'm talking about April, May, June, July. <laughs> until and, this year. Well, until, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was, uh, we had to pour concrete, we had to do this, that, and the other, and the weather would, just wouldn't allow it. It would just rain in all the time. But as I recall, you had an excellent helper there, and a gentleman that we both knew and loved named Fred LaRue. Yeah, Fred came along kind of later, and he stayed in some in one of the apartments, and. He just loved the place, and I would feed off of him. I mean, I would. Uh, he was a knowledgeable guy. You know? So gambling came along, and you sold out there, and eventually you end up over here at Giuseppe's. Yeah, I, I leased my property of the pier to, well, all the property to the Biloxi Bell, one of the first casinos. So you operated. promoted, just to make sure, you, you were one of the leading proponents with Jake Malagnich oh, yeah. and just a whole bunch of people to get casinos to come here to create jobs, jobs, jobs. Right. You ended up benefiting selling to a casino that went bankrupt. Yeah, unfortunately for <laughs> me and unfortunately for them, they made a choice to take make an investment in, rather than on the property, the property mm -hmm. where the in Biloxi, they went to Tunica and opened up a casino, and it just didn't work. Had, I they, had they spent that type of money on the property where the Biloxi Bell was, 
it may still be there. In the spirit of full disclosure, I worked at the Biloxi Bell for a little while, and yes, just so much money was dumped into Robinsonville, but it seems to me that you, like Jake Mladenich, always had something spinning up here on how to promote this area, and you still do that to this day. Oh, I do. I, I, I do. I, to, to some, uh, some people's annoyance. No, no, no. <laughs> I think you're like the mayor in that you're passionate about your beliefs. What do you think some of your strongest beliefs today on our Mississippi Gulf Coast? Well, the, the game has helped. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and I, it's still, I, th I still think it's one of the be best uh, kept secrets in, in, as far as hospitality industry goes. And I think we could broaden our base. Mm -hmm. As far as drive-in traffic, and I would, uh, we've got a small airport, but it's well appointed, and I would like to see them, uh, the powers that be, to advertise that, that that our airport that is so close to the amenities. It's not like driving it, uh, flying into Dallas, and your your uh, or any and major your city. Ground transportation is, it costs you more to get into the city than it does for the, the flight. Exactly. Taking, you know? Exactly. So I would. So they keep. Well, they were advertising in house, much on the coast about it. I said, like, go to your the regional points. Your yeah. points, where it was Dallas, Houston, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Memphis, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Advertise in those markets that it's such a short flight that you don't really have to go first class. And you, when you fly in, you fly into a small airport, well up point, like I said, and your ground transportation is, is, is minuscule compared to anywhere else. You seem to have always viewed Biloxi as a city of opportunity. Well, yeah. It was, I'm, when I, uh, I was born and raised here, of course, and for a while, I thought everybody lived on a peninsula. <laughs> the water was all around. You know, I just in the seafood and this, that, and the other. It, 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 when I I didn't appreciate it as much as till I got grown and I it was in the army and moved around and this, that, and the other. So then I'm going like, my God, these places don't have anything to, to like Biloxi has, and that's you know, it just mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. just to me it was a great place to grow up. And anybody who grew up anywhere else. Missed, missed out on a lot of stuff. I mean, it's <laughs> that's well said. Yeah. Well said. I want to tell you that this has been great to hear you talk about Biloxi, to well, talk about you. how it's evolved, and and where you think we may be going in the future. And uh, it, it's just very encouraging. I look at people like you, and I think of just so many other promoters. Uh, I've mentioned Jake a couple of times. Jake and John. Jake and John and, and my mentors too. Yeah, to a, to a large degree, yeah, they had exactly. such a broad influence on this community, mm -hmm. and uh, to see people like you continue to move it forward, uh, and uh -oh. to speak your mind. Well, thank you. I've always I've always done that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sharon Matina from Giuseppe's Restaurant. Today's feature is our Via Genovese. Hi, I'm Charlie. Today we're making a Via Genovese. So we start by doing the. Bill. First you want to pound it. You don't want to pound it too much. You want to get it just and right and tender. First you dip your bill in the flour and you come over here and dip it in the water. I mean milk, I'm sorry. Then you come back over there and your breadcrumbs. Your bill should be coming out looking like this. Covered in your breadcrumbs. Then we move on cooking our bill to the beef. These are ingredients for the bill to the beef. First you're going to start out with your oil. Your wine, your mushrooms, burn it to the heat, turn it down. While it's cooking, you make sure your oil is hot for your veal. You don't want to overcook it. You want to bring it to a nice and golden brown. Help your veal in. There we go. Turn your heat down. You don't want to overcook, remember? Turn the heat off. Get the oil to off. 
Beijo de novo. 